uh, <laughs> whether to share it or not. Sure. Okay, so I'll make a couple of quick announcements. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Hasna, and I'm with UNM's Division for Community Behavioral Health. Welcome to our Law and Mental Health Didactic. Um, a couple of announcements about our CE process. So we will be submitting a link in the last five minutes of the lecture in the chat box. So if you toggle your mouse at the bottom menu, you'll see a chat icon. You'll click that, and that will bring up your chat box. Um, click on the link and fill out the evaluation. A certificate of completion is automatically generated for you. Um, it's your responsibility to save a copy. So if you're joining us on your smartphone, you'll want to take a screenshot. If you're on your computer, just save it as a Word doc or a PDF. If you scroll down to the bottom right corner of the uh, certificate, you should be able to email yourself a copy. Um, and we're piloting a new process today for live captions. Um, the, we're having some issues, so please bear with us. Um, live captions are not automatic. You need to, um, I, I believe somewhere in your menu on your, if you just move your mouse around and find there's a CC button, you'll wanna uh, click that and then select show subtitles. If you don't see them automatically, it's not anything you're doing. We're just trying to coordinate with the third party um, folks right now and so and I don't believe they're yet on the um, on the meeting so um, and someone asked for us to repeat the CEU process I can submit that in the chat I think we want to just move on to our lecture now so I'll hand it over to you Julie. Rachel did you want to mention the QR code? Oh, right. And um, in addition to submitting a link in the chat, we're also going to pull up a QR code, uh, which will also link you to the evaluation. So you'll just take a picture with your smartphone of the QR code that will appear on the screen. Thanks, Julie. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the University of New Mexico Lawn Mental Health Didactic Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're glad to have you all here joining us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So first, I want to remind you to join us next week. At that time, we have John Edens, who's going to be presenting Psychopathy Evidence in Legal Proceedings, examining its probative value and prejudicial impact. Next, for our talk today, please ask your questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable. But just know we're probably not going to get to them until the end. Um, as always, we try our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Please forgive us if we can't get to yours. Um, again, for those of you who want CEUs, but who are on a tight schedule, you do have to stay for the full hour, but you don't have to stay longer than that. I will try to let you know when the hour has passed, but we will likely be staying on longer to address questions. So now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Randy Salikin. Dr. Salikin is a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Alabama in the clinical child concentration. His research focuses on understanding the causes and correlates of disruptive behavior in children and youth, and particularly those with conduct disorder and elevated psychopathic traits. His research has increasingly focused on the use of psychophysiological measurement to better understand the processes that might underlie the conduct disorder condition. He and his students offer psychological assessment and treatment to community and court-referred youth with disruptive behavior. Dr. Salikin is the author of several books related to conduct disorder, numerous research publications, and has received international recognition for his work. Dr. Salikin, we're grateful for your time and expertise. Thank you for being here today. On behalf of the University of New Mexico, I'd like to welcome you and thank you. I'm now gonna turn it over to you. 
Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining in uh, to listen today. So um, yeah, so um, yeah, we spent a, a lot of time thinking about conduct disorder in our lab and about um, you know, how to measure it and how to think about it. Um, and so, so that's what this talk is about. Um, and you can see the title there is conduct disorder advancing our understanding by using specifiers. And so the specifier uh, issue has come up uh, since there's been the introduction of the limited pro-social emotion uh, specifier. So I'm going to be talking about that and some other things as we go through this. Um, oh yeah, just to let you know, I don't have any financial relationship uh, to this program or um, and, and won't be getting uh, University of New Mexico in any kind of trouble or anything like that for <laughs> presenting the information that I do. Um, and my views don't necessarily um, uh, represent uh, the University of uh, New Mexico, so I won't get into trouble in that way either. So these are my own thoughts about conduct disorder and, and how to specify it. Um, so this is a bit of a busy slide, but um, there are some learning objectives here. Um, basically, what we're going to do is outline the characteristics of conduct disorder and its specifiers and trace the history of personality traits across versions of the DSM. Um, and we're also going to examine co-occurring disorders uh, for the purpose of identifying severe conduct disorder. Uh, so for the reason, the reason for doing that is um, just to get a sense of what's been done in the past uh, so we can understand a little bit about uh, the future and where we are now and also kind of where, where we might want to go with specifiers. Uh, then we're going to examine the factor structure of psychopathy with the PSCD. The PSCD is, um, stands for the Proposed Specifiers for Conduct Disorder Scores. And we're gonna look at that across several samples and just see how that's doing and discuss the potential implications for this uh, kind of measure, measurement model for understanding conduct disorder. And then I'm gonna to turn to examine the research uh, reviews that have shown some differences between the various dimensions of psychopathy. Um, and there's gonna be a focus on EEG research to kind of underscore some of the differences and the implications that might have for assessment, etiology, and treatment. Um, but don't worry if you're not like uh, that um, up on EEG research or you um, feel like um, that's not an area that familiar to you. I'm gonna kind of walk through that section and um, describe what we do there. So hopefully it will make it more clear to you just kind of uh, what we're looking for, uh, what we're trying to trying to find or try to understand and, and just how we go about doing that. So I'll, I'll walk through that so it'll, um, it makes sense. All right, so let's start talking about this. Um, what is conduct disorder? And I know a lot of you know this, um, but I, I thought we could kind of just start with that. And then also to kind of think about what the history of conduct disorder is. Um, so if we look at it right now in the DSM-5, we see that conduct disorder consists of 15 symptoms. And those 15 symptoms um, are parsed off into categories and you have this kind of aggression subtype, destruction, destruction subtype. And you can look at the items underneath of each of those things, um, bullies, threatens, intimidates, initiates physical fights, used a weapon, has been physically cruel to people under the aggression subtype and so forth. Under the destruction subtype, you got uh, de deliberately engaged in uh, fire setting or destroying property, um, kind of destruction to property. So, um, so we have like those two subtypes and then two other subtypes, the deceitfulness or theft subtype and the serious violation subtype. And under the deceitfulness or threat, you have broken into a house, building or car, often lies to obtain goods and favors, has stolen items of non-trivial value without confronting a victim. A serious violation stayed out late, um, has run away uh, from home over night more than two times, often truant from school and uh, other sets of criteria there too. So as you guys know, um, to, to get a diagnosis of conduct, sorry, you need those three of the 15 symptoms. And then um, if there's more than that and they're fitting into one category, then clinical psychologists and clinical forensic psychologists are trying to give people uh, information about where the youth might fall into that particular area. You're probably aware that in uh, 2013, um, the DSM uh, added, DSM-5 added this limited pro-social emotions specifier. So there's two um, 
you know, two different specifiers in there now, as well as the kind of mild, moderate, and severe kind of ways of categorizing chronic disorder. And with this, you can um, use Moffitt's early late onset specifier, and you can also use this limited pro-social emotion specifier, which gets at kind of um, some things that we would consider psychopathic traits, right? So it's got lack of remorse or guilt, callous lack of empathy, unconcerned about performance, shallow or deficient affect. And um, if a youth has chronic disorder and then they have two of these uh, symptoms, two or more, uh, they would meet criteria for having this, this specifier. And I think there's a duration on that too of 12 months that they have to have these uh, symptoms for. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, if they do, they would get both chronic disorder and limited pro-social motion and possibly it's early onset. Um, so if we look at this slide, these are the PCLR items, um, Bob Hare's uh, model for psychopathy. And you can see there's um, at the top of this, many might be familiar with this factor one and factor two, but those factors are then broken into individual facets. And under factor one, you can see facet one, facet two. And under factor two, you can see facet three and facet four. And essentially um, what you have here is with this limited pro-social emotion, you have this affective component. And some people might think with conduct disorder, and uh, you may have this factor four kind of idea, antisocial kind of char characteristics combined with facet two, this affective component. Um, and so, yeah, so it's one component of psychopathy. And that's one thing our research group has asked about is, you know, is this one component something that um, we should have or, or kind of should we have more components or one, you know, why, why kind of this one component? Um, so that led us to kind of think about what is the history behind chronic disorder. And so that's where this tracing of the symptoms becomes important. It's like, we were like, where does all this kind of come from? And why are some of these symptoms in there and other ones not? Um, and so that kind of got us kind of just kind of looking back at the history and just tr tracing, tracing what, what's going on here. I think if you go back kind of way back, um, it gets you back to Lee Robbins and her 1966 book, Deviant Children Grown Up. And uh, after the full colon in that book, it is about sociopathy. So she's talking about sociopathy. Um, and, you know, at that time, right around that time, she had found a bunch of cases in, in a St. Louis child guidance clinic. And um, you couldn't do this now today, but at the time um, she found these files of kind of basically chronic disorder view or obsessional defiant view. And their names and that were on these files, of course. And um, my understanding is they followed these people up in, into adulthood because it was 30, that's 30 years later at the time they kind of found these things. Um, and they followed them up and found out that many of them were still antisocial. Uh, so her and Cloninger and some other um, psychiatrists were um, thinking that this is pretty informative information. You know, these people um, who were caught in a, in a, in a child guidance in a, uh, facility 30 years later still had significant conduct uh, problems. And so then at that point, they kind of got interested in looking at the kind of symptoms that might be predictive of later antisocial personality disorder. And for them, um, they focused a lot on specific behaviors that um, resulted in, in the prediction um, or connections to adult psychopathy. So that's where you kind of get this behavioral, partially where you get this behavioral um, model for psychopathy uh, or antisocial personality disorder, where we're going to measure these behavioral traits and those are going to be what we look at in kids. And maybe that's something we should be doing in adult too. And that's the antisocial personality disorder component that we see in, in the manual. Um, you know, at the, roughly the same time, maybe, you know, even earlier, I guess, Cleckley um, had written the book, The Mask of Sanity. Um, and he really thought that personality characteristics were important for looking at antisocial individuals. And so if you recall, he has those 16 criteria that he outlined. I'm not gonna list them here for you guys, but he had these 16 criteria that were very personality based. And um, he thought those were really key to finding out who's gonna be kind of more, your more kind of severe um, antisocial personality. And here, of course, after that, um, you know, they started developing the measure for testing psychopathy in prisons in Vancouver. And um, 
they yeah they started looking at this and it's running parallel to the you know the DSM you know three and four at the time, and all this research is coming out on on, on psychopathy and a lot having to do with its predictive ability, and some of that showing that it's um, maybe more more predictive or offers more prediction than antisocial personality, which is based on more of this behavioral based model. Um, so that led us to kind of take a look at, let's take a look at the evolution of this, um, which I've been just talking about. And so we're kind of looking at this um, through kind of a lens of what is, how has psychopathy been defined? And then also how is, how is the antisocial personality disorder and conduct disorder been defined? Um, and of course, we know that with um, all this stuff, a lot of it starts out with Emil Kraepelin and his initial book on psychiatry and where he started to sketch out the earliest kind of symptoms of all these disorders, many of them which have kind of held uh, today. Um, and even that far back, you know, you had uh, them talking about this disorder of And if we move kind of further into it, um, we have the standard uh, classification uh, system that was coming out in, in 1933. And then in the DSM-1 in 1952, we had sociopathy appear in there. In those early manuals, you know, they were really more of like a description. There wasn't like specific criteria that they were pointing out, but there was more of like, um, you know, a paragraph or a few sentences that you would read to describe the disorder. In this case, with the DSM one, they were talking about uh, sociopathy. And it was kind of based a little bit more on uh, Cleckley's kind of idea about it. In the DSM two, again, you see this sociopathy come out. So it's talking about the personality characteristics again here. And then in red, I have um, that you couldn't simply have antisocial behavior. So, if, you know, from where we are today, um, this is quite a bit different because it's saying, you know, you really have to have these personality characteristics. And if you just, let's say, are breaking the law, uh, you wouldn't necessarily meet the criteria for having this personality disorder. And then um, it kind of, it's, you know, kind of goes back and forth over the years here. So I'm going to trace kind of, you know, it's going back and forth between being kind of more of a behavioral based model to being more of a, a maybe a personality based model. In 1980 with the DSM-3 is the first time we see conduct disorder displayed in the DSM. That's partly because, um, you know, prior to that, we didn't really think, this is kind of odd, but we didn't really think, um, I'm not saying you guys, but, um, you know, clinicians in general, um, a good portion of them didn't believe that you had disorders in childhood. So most disorders happened late adolescence and adulthood. And kids might just have problems about being worried about things or being a little sad, but they weren't, they didn't have, you know, disorders. And so um, you didn't have this kind of, um, you know, section uh, for disorders. And it wasn't until 1980 you get this special section uh, for childhood disorders and then conduct disorder appearing there. Before that, um, you know, you'd see things like, uh, even in 1952, you'd see conduct disturbance, but not disorder. And the disturbance was used to, you know, talk about a reaction a child might be having to something, maybe, you know, parents or some, some, some reacting to parents or some other issue that was not um, a specific kind of like medical model disorder. Um, and the DSM uh, 3R and the three, um, you have conduct disorder kind of, uh, again, repeated in the DSM-3R. You do have this threshold number of symptoms coming through. So that's the first time we see this, like, hey, if you have three of 15, uh, we're going to categorically say that you have conduct disorder. Uh, but before that, again, it was just paragraphs kind of describing this stuff. So this is the first point where we see category. And it fits with this idea of taxon and our medical model that there's, um, you know, that, that the person does actually have, have a disorder. Uh, moving along here, uh, the DSM-4, we see the conduct disorder again, and this is the first time we see the early uh, distinction, early onset distinction. So this is where Moffitt's, Terry Moffitt's Adolescent Limited Life Course Persistent uh, Taxonomy comes in and is codified in the DSM-4, and now, now you have this uh, specifier where you can look at um, early onset and late onset with kids being you know, starting uh, their antisocial behavior, you know, I think it's at the age of 10 or before, and that antisocial behavior is, you know, uh, severe uh, and frequent and early. Um, then, you know, her argument and other people's have been that there, it fits this pattern of more of a chronic, chronic kind of offender, and there's some data on that. And again, there's just kind of patterns of results for that, but um, 
it's, it's not kind of a, like a full proof, proof model, let's say. That brings us to the DSM-5. And in the DSM-5, we have chronic disorder. Again, we have this early onset specifier. And now we have plus this limited pro-social emotions, which brings us back to that original slide where um, you see the specifier of um, limited uh, pro-social emotions and you have uh, four um, you know, uh, criteria there that people have to rate and decide upon and then um, you know, make decisions whether they, they fit that model too. Um, so I wanna kind of go back through this just a little bit, a little bit more kind of tracing this. Um, this conduct disorder. So if we go back again, we kind of see some familiar things on the slide, the seven psychopaths at the top, sociopathy. Um, you do have, that's the, the CP reaction is what I was talking about is uh, you can have a conduct uh, disturbance, they were calling it reaction at the, in the DSM-1 level. The DSM-2, even though it was, uh, you know, kind of in paragraph kind of form, they did talk about this conduct problems originating within the person or outside of the person. So that is getting a little bit at this issue. Is it characterological, the conduct problems, or is it something that's like a reaction to the environment? Um, so we are kind of, I think, there just seeing a little bit of this idea that maybe it's something about the personality of the kid. Um, Quay in uh, 1980 with the DSM-3, um, that's his conduct disorder. And he had these terms like unsocialized and socialized. Um, so you had to categorize the kid as unsocialized or socialized. And they also has to, had to be categorized as aggressive versus non-aggressive. Uh, so it created up this kind of um, cross, um, you know, lock between these different sets of symptoms. And I think Quay was really trying to, at that point, have um, psychopathic traits be part of it. And so um, the unsocialized was actually a good portion of that was a kind of psychopathic traits he was talking about there. And then he had aggressive versus unaggressive um, as another way that you could categorize youth. And, um, and then, um, yeah, uh, he, he kind of thought that social bonds and manipulation and deceit and other things like that were, were important characteristics to be assessing in the kids. Uh, the chronic disorder um, in later years kind of moves away from that model. And then in DSM-5, 2013, you kind of see it coming back. So you might've thought, well, all this is new with the limited pro-social emotion, but actually, you know, some of the stuff was in there. So. <laughs> So we were kind of tracing it and kind of finding this stuff and it was interesting. So if we look at this slide here in the DSM-3 in 1980, we were just counting them. If you counted the number of kind of like psychopathic traits or personality traits to help explain chronic start, you have three GM traits and three CHCU traits for, um, for that particular version of conduct disorder. As you go to the DSM-3R, you have one GM trait, it's lying. And then they removed the CU traits. So we're like, hey, where did all those kind of CU traits go? Um, and then in the DSM-4, you have conduct disorder again, this three of 15 symptoms and one GM trait. They may get it or may not, depending on uh, what, what you pick up on. And then the DSM-5, uh, we go back to conduct disorder and feed four CU traits that are used as a specifier. Um, so they've always kind of been there um, in different ways, these kind of traits. and um, and yeah, you kind of see them over, you know, kind of being moved out, uh, put back in and, um, and then moved out again, depending on the year that, uh, and, and the work group and who's making decisions about this. So, um, so for us, it led to these questions about like, um, you know, we sort of thought, um, you know, that maybe, maybe some of this is uneven and unsystematic and maybe not that helpful for we're talking about kids. Um, and even though some of the stuff we would kind of need to think about the wording and how we worded it, maybe some of it is important to kind of have it in there to be able to be more specific about um, the type and uh, sense of system that youth, youth have. Um, so we look at this other issue too. So, you know, there's this other issue of like, you know, I guess Robin's argument is, you know, if we just assess behavior, we're kind of going to kind of get at the thing that we care about. Um, with the DSM-5, you know, I guess they're making the argument this LPE is really going to help us out. There's also in this history, like, of uh, conduct disorder, there's this idea that, that, that kind of, 
you know, psychopathy and these personality traits are already in the DSM. And we can pick up on that by just looking at comorbidity. Um, and where does this idea come from? Uh, it, it partly comes from Don Lynham. And you may recall this paper, Early Identification of the Chronic Offenders, who is the fledgling psychopath. Um, and so with that paper, um, what he was kind of doing was saying that, you know, that this um, personality is condition that maybe is linked to CD is already really in there. It's just, if you get at some stuff like inattention and um, use inattention hyperactivity and conduct problems, you really are at that point assessing psychopathy. And then there's this kind of long tradition of people thinking that ADHD and hyperactivity are linked with, uh, uh, you know, antisocial personality and psychopathy. And I, I don't actually agree with that. I don't think it's correct. And I think we can kind of make a lot of mistakes there. But anyway, uh, Don wrote a really compelling paper here, the fledgling psychopath paper, which was a great paper. And then he followed up with papers that um, tested, you know, to see whether chronic disorder, inattention and hyperactivity correlated and, uh, you know, kind of fit this, what he would call a nominological net to explain a childhood psychopathy. So I want to talk a little bit about this just a bit. So the idea here is kind of like, um, first we have, you know, the section of just defining it there that we covered, but then here the idea is kind of like, well, we, we could just look at comorbid conditions or other conditions and that's going to help explain it to us. So one model is called kind of this comorbid subtype position, which is just the fledgling psychopath, psychopath argument, which is Lynham's argument. It means just if you have those three different disorders and um, as clinicians, we filled it out and you kind of met criteria for all those, I could just assume, make the assumption that you probably will have uh, at some point APD and psychopathy. The other one is that ADHD um, leads to CD. So it's not that you have CD and maybe psychopathic traits right away, but ADHD kind of leads you into having that. Um, the other model is that ADHD is a risk factor. It has things about it like, you know, being on the go all the time, running like a motor, terms like that that they use that then lead to uh, and lead to sensation seeking. And that sensation seeking leads to APD. Um, so these are all kind of, as you can see, kind of mediational models about how you might get there. And then there's the ODD model. Can't forget about ODD and ODD that maybe ODD leads to CD. And then that lends, leads to later severe APD and um, uh, kind of problems that way. So um, that model has not always worked out. None of these models have a great deal of data to support them. And so they tend to suffer from, um, yeah, kind of being able to support them uh, very, very well. Even the ODD, uh, which has been separated out into different, parcel out into different symptoms, as you guys know, in the DSM-5, and you now have three categories for that. Even when they do that, um, and they look at like the spiteful or headstrong specific uh, subcomponent of ODD, it's not great at specifically, um, yeah, explaining uh, this as well as possibly going right at the symptoms themselves. So, uh, so you have that kind of problem. Interesting. One thing we came across, and I didn't, I didn't know this exactly, but um, ODD. You know, we always talk about the stepping stone model. ODD leads to CD and APD, and it's never really done a great job of that. Um, now that Burke and Stringer has kind of separated things out, it's helped. Um, but ODD was actually meant to be kind of a, a childhood version of a in a sense of passive aggressive personality disorder. Um, and I didn't know that. So, so that's something we came across and we were like, oh, like, so that's kind of like it's linkage. Like that's what they thought it was linked to in the end. Um, so in the summary here, I would just say, after reviewing all this stuff, we kind of thought, you know, there's kind of uneven and unsystematic coverage of psychopathy. And we think, is that good? Maybe it's good. Maybe we just should be looking at behavior. Um, but maybe if personality is helpful, maybe we should be doing it more systematically and looking at the multidimensional dimensional models we have for um, psychopathy to explain it. Comorbid conditions may or may not account for psychopathy condition. I don't think they actually do a good job of it. I think a lot of people who have ADHD or OD or other things, having them talked about in terms of that is probably uh, not necessarily fair because I don't think necessarily a lot of kids would keep going onto that, that trajectory. Uh, so the point uh, three there is that personality could be important. And um, our group and other groups, I think, are starting to say it's going to be difficult to get a good read on etiology without proper trait coverage, these different kind of characteristics that we think underpin psychopathy and relate to conduct disorder. Um, and it might be the case that some combination of conduct disorder and psychopathic traits, again, probably we'd need to think about renaming these things, may be helpful in understanding 
youth with chronic problems, both uh, in terms of the mechanisms uh, involved in the disorder, but also in terms of the clinical work that we do in terms of um, assessment and treatment. Okay, so that's going to um, take us to another section. So I'm kind of changing gears here and talking about the PSCD. This is the proposed specifier for chronic disorder and its measurement. Um, part of the work in our lab has been to um, look at this and look at the different um, uh, different kind of symptoms that accompany chronic disorder, and to see if these additional specifiers might be kind of helpful. Um, and so we've gone and had like a series of different studies. This one's in Spain with a pretty large sample of 22, just over 2,200 people. And, you know, what we've been doing is kind of looking at um, first to see if the factor structure holds up. And in this case, we see that the factor structure holds up and there's pretty good parameter estimates coming off the hierarchical construct of psychopathy there. So you see for GM traits, there's a parameter of 0.74, uh, for CU a parameter of 0.62, uh, DI. 0.74 and CD 0.9. So you have these really strong uh, parameters for it. And all the items seem to be working out pretty well uh, with a very young sample. So uh, what, what it's telling us is that these uh, characteristics uh, are seemingly applicable to this. Uh, this is a younger um, child age group. This is a smaller sample, but one in Belgium. And it's showing us again, kind of structurally that uh, hierarchically this model works of having like a psychopathic personality at the top and then GM, CU, DI, and CD traits underneath and all have pretty good parameter estimates again there. Um, showing, you know, basically that this can be modeled and it's been modeled across gender. There's invariance across gender and it seems to be working across, um, across groups. This is another uh, kind of a model based out of China, mainland China, and the four-factor structure here works as well. As well. So this is, again, a um, four-factor model, but it's different in the sense that it's, um, it's a correlated four-factor model instead of a hierarchical four-factor model. And you can see all the kind of correlations between, the, you know, the constructs um, are moderate to large, which is good. And um, this is some of the work that Craig Newman was doing, and he was trying to see if he could model a smaller number of items, uh, a 13 uh, item measure that might be used in research. So part of the aim of some of this is Andy, to- Andy, can it, I interrupt you for just a second? I, yeah. People are asking for you to please clarify what GMCU, DI, and CD mean. Okay, sorry, yeah. Um, thank you, Julie, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, that's some of our own terminology, I apologize. So the GM is interpersonal traits and the CU is affective traits. And the DI are daring impulsive traits and the CD is standing for conduct disorder. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of different terms for this, um, that interpersonal active lifestyle and antisocial would be the PCL model. And then I think, you know, at Frick's model has been narcissism, I think callous and emotional traits, impulsivity, and then they don't have conduct disorder in there. And, yeah, and then at the adult level, I, I think Scott Lilienfeld would have called it fearless dominance, and uh, they had some other uh, terms for impulsive antisocial and uh, impulsive antisociality. So there are these different terms. Um, so yeah, if I back it up here, I hope this helps. At the top there is just psychopathy. Down below is grandiose manipulative, callous and emotional, DI, which is daring impulsive, and then conduct disorder. And uh, with the DSM five really kind of what we have is the bubble, the second bubble, the CU bubble, and the fourth bubble, the CD bubble. And I'm raising these questions about, you know, kind of what, why is that the case? And in terms of history, what's the, what's the history behind this? And these measurement models seem to show that um, kids have all these kind of traits. And so that's part of the, the aim of that research there. Now, this is a sample out of Italy. And um, this sample is showing that you can model conduct disorder off separately. So this is, you can see conduct disorder on the left there, and that's modeled out uh, separately from the lower um, bubbles there, which are getting at the GM, CU, and DI again, during impulsive, callous, and emotional, and grandiose manipulative traits. And yeah, it's just a bifactor different model, but essentially we're seeing that these things um, can be modeled in kids and they do seem to fit uh, well. So, 
So um, that brings me to the next section I'm going to turn to, and hopefully I answered your question there about uh, the actual items. And so the next section is kind of review papers, and this gets at etiology. So partly we've now talked about definition, and I've got into a little bit about the structure of conduct disorder and the personality traits that might align with it. And then I thought I would turn just a little bit to review papers. Um, so in our lab, uh, we have conducted a few review papers, and part of this is to get at the etiology and understand the etiology of the disorder. So this research review was one that um, was commissioned by the Journal of uh, Child Psychology and Psychiatry, and it is um, questioning what do we know about psychopaths, psychopathic traits in children. And uh, through that review, what we learned was that there, um, there are quite a lot of differences in what the correlates are for the broad, broader construct uh, as compared to what they might be for those underlying bubbles, those things that we were just talking about. And so it raises the question in terms of etiology, um, you know, is it, does it mean to one thing to be, you know, uh, have a full set of psychopathic traits? Does it one mean one thing to have antisocial personality disorder? And then does it mean other things when you might have these other kind of components of it? And I thought I would turn a little bit to a neuroscience paper that we wrote to just talk about that and use it as an illustration of possibly the differences that can be found in terms of um, the etiology based on factor, um, the, the, based on what you're looking at. So whenever you have the DSM and you take something and you have a definition for it and it um, has a set of criteria, it's gonna mean something uh, in terms of its psychophysiological measurement. And um, we, if, if we kind of change it a little bit, it's going to mean something else. So, um, so that's partly what we're keeping an eye on here a little bit. So um, this was a systematic review that we did um, on EEG research and collected basically all the EEG research on psychopathy and EEG. Now, you know, you might be wondering why am I keep talking about psychopathy? I am talking about it because if we kind of look back at the history again, Lee Robbins, even though she was creating this almost all person, all sorry, almost behavioral based model, her book, Deviant Children Grown Up, was about sociopathy. So she was talking about sociopathy, and uh, we talked about it as psychopathy now. And Hare and all these other um, people were doing this different line, but it was all kind of it was all kind of um, psychopathy. And even in the four TR, they refer to APD as um, you know being parallel to psychopathy. So kind of that's that's uh, the under undergirding kind of uh, framework here for us. Um, so we did this kind of review and we were looking at it, um, trying to find something about the neurodynamics, the brain functioning of individuals with this disorder. And, you know, basically this slide is just telling us that we do have localization, as you guys know, in the brain. And we have these two hemispheres and they're doing different things. Um, and um, we have lobes and uh, yeah, just different parts of the brain that are responsible for different functions in us. And, um, and of course, with the neuroscience research, they're trying to figure out what it is um, that might be aberrant in a particular psychiatric disorder. And in this case, with uh, psychopathy, we're always trying to figure out what might be might be kind of aberrant or off. -putting. So this an electroencephalogram EEG, um, just really basically for those who aren't familiar with it, is a machine that's recording electrical activity along the brain in a specific way, and it is operated by placing these electrodes on the scalp. You can see on the um, child's head there. And you can see the brain waves on the screen. So those electrodes um, capture electrical impulses off the skull and the wires send that information to an amplifier. And that amplifier then um, is um, uh, amplifying that signal, signal and it's recorded and we can see it on the screen. And then once we can see it on the screen, then you know, we have to kind of analyze what that information means. And I apologize if some of you guys know some of this information already, uh, but I'm just trying to provide a little bit of background on it. So what we can do is we might be looking at time intervals um, and um, we could look at these things, the slide is uh, talking about things that we can look at that are called like event related potentials. These are ERPs. And we name them certain things like N100 or uh, P100 and they're sensory ERPs and we're trying to measure at the very first response somebody's attention to a stimuli that we're presenting to them. And it's usually measured in the back of the head on the occipital lobes. And so you can see down on the bottom that arrow there, for reference, we may see a spike in the P100 when you're doing a flashing light. So 
your brain does respond whenever, you know, whenever uh, you have stimuli coming in and that electricity shows up on the scalp. And if you have a novel, bright something, you will get this, what we call a P1 spike um, that shows up on, on that screen after you analyze the data. And there are other higher level processings there that as we move downstream. So there's like P200s and N200s. Um, these are all, the 200 means 200 milliseconds down uh, after the presentation of some stimuli. So we have it time-locked in the figure there. And that one indicates a cognitive matching system. So it's when our brain recognizes that pairs of items are matches, uh, we'll see this P200 uh, peak up. And our brain is saying, are these items the same? So the P100 is just like, hey, there's something in my environment. P200 is like, are these you know, items the same? And the N200, uh, measured at 200 milliseconds after the stimulus presentation, also functions as this um, determining discrepancies. And um, it's uh, oftentimes considered a mismatch detector. And so you can see in this arrow, and for reference, for your reference, you may see this spike in the N200 ERP when we recognize that two things, which should match, actually don't match, and it causes our brain to do something. Um, and so we can kind of pick those things up. If we move further downstream from this locked, um, time-locked stimulus that we presented to people, we have this conscious processing that's going on. And so, you know, 100, 200 milliseconds, we're probably not conscious of what's happening. It's just that the brain is sending a signal uh, to us that maybe from the lower brainstem or, or somewhere else that something's going on. And it's only at about 300 milliseconds, maybe a little bit earlier, but rough then it end that people think we're conscious of what's going on. Um, and we can look at other things like P300 there and something called the LPP, which is a late positive potential. So the P300 is measured at 300 milliseconds after the stimulus presentation. It's thought to represent things like working memory and updating and understanding things. So it's kind of like this thing of like, what am I seeing? What is it? And higher frequencies there, it's true of all these kind of things. If it's higher and earlier, it means you have greater attention and superior mental, possibly superior mental processing for that stimuli. Um, and a common task they do that for that is like the oddball task. You might be listening to a sound over and over again, then you get a really loud ping. And it's an oddball, and it could be a picture too. And that picture or the oddball sound cues your uh, mind up to say, hey, there's something new in my environment and you have to pay attention to it. And the LPP is emotional processing. And it's more about like, how do I feel about what I'm seeing? And it gets at things like, you know, if you saw a car accident or something like that, um, all these kind of spikes would go off in your head, but the LPP would be the part where you start to resonate with, hey, are those people hurt? I wonder if they're okay. And it's this processing of the emotional information. And then there's the spectra data. You could just look at people and see like this could be running, they could be hooked up to electrodes and I could just watch them and see what kind of, um, yeah, see what, the, see what the brain waves are like. And then I can start to analyze that information a little bit. So without going into too much depth, these kind of reviews um, give us some information about a disorder. And in this case, we hypothesize that those with elevated psychopath traits would not show deficits in a lot of areas. And this helps us out with theory and other things too. Um, so let's just kind of walk through these. We, you know, we said in terms of deficits, we didn't think they'd have a deficit in orienting. We didn't think they'd have a, a deficit in associative learning, connecting two previously related um, stimuli. So those are things that you can get it with that mismatch and other things. So um, you can learn about associate learning there. And we, we were kind of saying, they're not going to have difficulty connecting two previously unrelated stimuli if they should be connected. And we can also test error processing. Like what does the brain do when they make an error? And the brain does say, send a signal when you make an error. And we can kind of look at that and see if um, when you make that error, yeah, just how much uh, the brain is responding to that, that, that specific error. And we can also look at things like inhibition. And that's like being able to stop an ongoing behavior that we want to stop. And um, with this disorder and social personality disorder, and sometimes they talk about impulsivity um, and kids with conduct disorder, um, this idea of being able to stop an ongoing behavior is healthy and adaptive if that behavior needs to change. And so that, that's what that particular one is going at. And um, yeah, and so um, we can test those. 
But we did think that um, this disorder would show processing deficits with emotional, kind of emotional uh, characteristics and emotional problems. So um, basically we re reviewed 68 studies here. We went through a lot of different kind of um, yeah, tests uh, that people have done uh, with um, people who had this disorder. And we found that um, there were no differences or they were very subtle in terms of um, attention, alerting and memory. So people who have these traits um, didn't show any differences on something like the P100, like if you flash a light, are they kind of alert to it and aware to it? Um, or matching on the P200, were they able to match things? They were actually able to match things. And so in terms of brain functioning and neurodynamic functioning, they seem to be about the same as people who wouldn't have the condition or have low levels of the traits. The only thing is we did find subtle differences and sometimes they were emotionally based. So uh, Ariel Baskin Summers actually found with Joe Newman and some other people that um, there could be a deficit in terms of threat processing. So, um, and this is where, you know, kind of in terms of helping with the theoretical models with the response modulation being one model about how psychopathy developments develops. She found that the PU100 was lower when they were, um, when they were um, focused on another task. So if they had something else to do and they're really focused on it and there was like a shock involved, um, they could be less concerned and less aware of that shock than people who, um, who didn't have uh, higher levels of these, these kind of traits. We looked at other things that you could, you could determine and without getting into too much detail here, but you could look at things like face processing, this mismatch detection and memory updating um, I haven't talked too much about phase processing here, but basically there's something called the N170. And whenever you see a face or eyes, you'll see the spike on EEG and it will um, be indicative of you seeing a face and eyes. And, um, you know, one, one notion has been that people who have this disorder uh, might, you know, might have a deficit in that area. But we didn't find that to be the case here, not for the N170, not for the N200 and P300. If you recall, that's when your brain started to say, what is it? What is this stimulus I'm seeing? And there was no difference there. Um, there were other indices for looking at associative learning and processing, and we found no differences with, with something up there called the CNV, contingent negative variation, or the error ERN, which is, that's the error-related negativity. You make an error and your brain does uh, have a response to that. In this case, there was no difference between high and low levels of psychopathic traits. Um, and yeah, FRN is kind of the same idea. The only place down in the bottom right there where you see differences, at least consistent differences, was in this late, late processing of information. Um, so we found that uh, as you got further down in terms of like elaborative processing, and some people think this is about how much you care about uh, something that might have happened. Um, that is something that uh, people who have these traits terminate faster. So um, it might be like the car accident ex example. If we walk through that again, you, you're driving down the road, you see a car accident. Um, all those you know, P100s would obviously show up. Other things would show up. But when it got to like late processing, as you drove, drive by the accident, um, a lot of people's late positive potential would keep going. And that's what actually, if you're like the first one there to see the accident, that's what's you know, causes you to kind of stop and pull over and go back and help. Um, but with this condition, uh, what they found is that um, in this review is that that gets terminated really early. And so you have this like processing of, open, of information that um, really kind of um, is terminated quickly. And then there are other differences but, that I won't go into all of them here, but that's the only kind of main difference we found there. But in the bottom green is what I wanted to kind of highlight a little bit more in terms of etiology here, because what we did find a lot of is that um, there were F1 and F2 differences. Now, F1 and F2 are factor one and factor two components of psychopathy. So that's the GM CU component and the DI and CD component. So there are differences in that and they, F1 have many, many less cognitive deficits, um, but they do have some of the emotional deficits. And the, um, 
F2 has quite a few more of the uh, kind of cognitive deficits, like maybe matching things up or determining what it, something is, other things like that. So we see these differences come out. They're kind of a wash. In a sense, they're a wash at the full scale score. So why is that important? Um, it's important because it, it, it is telling us that when we go back to kind of defining um, the disorder, conduct disorder, probably it does matter that when you have, you know, the broader symptoms of conduct disorder and you're just saying somebody did something wrong on a behavioral level, and then you are trying to add in psychopathic symptoms or personality symptoms for the boys and girls that have that disorder, it really does matter kind of which ones you add in and how many of you them you add in to whether or not and to what extent they might have psychophysiological problems. So, so hopefully that's, that's kind of clear um, and that the purpose of the meta-analysis is to try to show you that, uh, or the review is to show you that these large sets of studies, there are these kind of differences that emerge um, at the component level, sometimes that are running in different directions from one another. And so just to kind of elaborate on that point before I kind of turn, turn the page here and move on to something else, um, Emily McDougall uh, conducted a study on skin conductance, and this was on conduct disordered youth and is published in Psychophysiology. And she found the same thing with skin conductance in the sense that at the broader construct level, um, you don't get any of these maybe differences between high and low scores, but at the component level, you do get differences and they seemed to run in, in different uh, directions. Um, that key et al. in 2020 also did a study on, and this is an EEG study on alpha symmetry, and that's also published in Psychophysiology, and she found the same thing there, that um, you know, it kind of matters whether you're looking at grandiose manipulative traits or callous and emotional traits. And sometimes in these studies, grandiose manipulative traits are getting more like skin conductance, sweat and perspiration. And so that means the brain is actually a little bit more operative when the fear stimuli is in, in, in the presence. And if um, you're callous and emotional, you may not be getting those signals of perspiration and sweat that um, are causing you to be concerned about something in your environment. And Harrison um, et al. just did a study on uh, cortisol, testosterone, and estradiol. And that's also just uh, coming out in psychophysiology. And similarly, uh, she's finding that these component uh, differences matter in terms of the psychophysiology of the kid. So I realize it's kind of a future, you know, kind of a future model kind of perspective. Um, but I do think it's important for us clinically as clinicians and forensic clinicians uh, to get a sense of this, uh, to know kind of the history of conduct disorder and to know. Uh, what it might mean psychophysiologically for kids. And clinically, um, Costas, Fanti, and other people have um, looked at the interaction of those, those balls, those different things that we were looking at, the grandiose level of callous and emotional traits. And they basically put them in models with large groups of kids. And what they found is like, for example, in the Fanti study is the combination of GM and CU traits resulted in much worse outcomes for kids in terms of chronic problems and other things. And so we are going to need to kind of look at these latent profile analyses models and other models, configurations of these traits. Um, and there's a special section coming out in the Journal of Criminal Justice and one just out in uh, a couple of years ago in Journal of Psychopath Psychopathology and Behavioral Assessment that do show um, they compete the models and show that um, the broader construct uh, results in worse outcomes and that different configurations have different so just in conclusion, I would just say that uh, I think we kind of need to relook at conduct disorder structurally. If the behavioral criteria that Robbins initially started out with are helpful, we should keep those criteria. And that would mean keeping the 15 criteria and maybe having three that we kind of assess and also having those subtypes that, um, uh, that are now in the DSM-5. Maybe those are still helpful. Uh, aggression towards people and animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness and theft and serious bias to rules. Um, if the limited pro-social emotion remains helpful, researchers and clinicians would want to keep that specifier, I guess, as well. And if these correlates of psychopathy and the psychophysiological information I was just presenting you and also, you know, behavioral correlates continue to produce distinct findings, it may be important for clinicians and researchers to examine CD in conjunction with these broader sets of traits um, and the full 
range of um, the psychopathic traits. And that would mean that in the future, uh, we might have uh, three specifiers for conduct disorder. We would have CU traits, and we published this in a couple different papers now, 2016 um, and 2017, uh, one in the British Journal of Psychiatry and one in the Journal of um, uh, clinical uh, child psychology uh, and psychiatry. And I, I list those both at the end of these presentations, but they're they're make, kind of making the argument that a model for conduct sort of might uh, be better off by incorporating these different things. Um, and this is just kind of a, a bit of a repeat here in that the brain, the motivational and the brain and other related personality core factors and correlates might be um, different for each of these things and they might be different how they connect with conduct disorder. And I know I'm kind of running a little thin on time here. Um, I, yeah, I would just kind of uh, stress that I think that the, there are kind of now these efforts to get these broader range, uh, wider range kind of assessment tools out there to start testing it. Uh, and that's the best way to kind of find out um, any differences that may exist and uh, how that might help inform us in terms of our clinical and forensic practice in the future. Um, and just to recap and cover what we did here, uh, we just traced the history of CD. Um, we noticed when we were tracing it that these symptoms were kind of going in and out in an uneven and unsystematic fashion with sometimes CU traits being pulled on and sometimes they're pulled out. GM traits some in, times in there, sometimes out. Sometimes there's just one of them like lying, but not the other ones. Um, we did take a look at does comorbidity help answer that? And I think actually it doesn't help us. Um, and it makes us think that um, maybe we should look at uh, other ways of doing this than trying to, trying to look at comorbidity. And we talked about a couple of review papers and specifically EEG to highlight that there are these distinct correlates and we can find them in large kind of groups of studies in these reviews now. And uh, finally, just to suggest that CD may benefit from additional specification if we're gonna uh, understand uh, CD more, more fully. And so I am kind of running close out of time and I'm gonna stop there and just see if we have any questions. I'll turn it over to Julie. We do have a number of questions. I can go ahead and start reading them out to you if you're okay with that. Yeah. Rachel, did you want to say anything before we start with questions? I just want to share the QR code real quick with folks. Um, do you see it, Julie? I do. Okay, cool. So folks, if you're on your smartphone, you just take a picture of that QR code and then it should link you to the evaluation. So I'll leave it up for a minute and you guys can um, go uh, with the questions. Thank you. And this is the official end of the talk, but we are going to stay on to, to answer your questions. Um, so let's see. With respect to differential diagnosis, are there efforts to assess for trauma exposure prior to diagnosing children with conduct disorder? Many symptoms of disruptive behavior are similar to those in children with chronic trauma exposure who exhibit symptoms of complex trauma. And then similarly, are there data on racial differences in the diagnosis of conduct disorder? Because clinically what's often observed in deconstructing the school to prison pipeline is a pattern of children of color being disproportionately diagnosed with ODD and CD. Those are really, really very good questions. Um, yeah, and so I'm aware, yeah, I'm aware of this literature and they're really great questions. And I think, yeah, we need to be mindful of all this. Um, and yeah, I know Patricia Kerrig is doing a lot of work on this with trauma and conduct disorder youth. And I feel like, you know, any, any psychiatric disorder um, can be mimicked by other things. And we need to be aware of like kids who are traumatized and kids in the detention centers and facilities who are traumatized. And so I think, you know, what, what we really need to be doing there uh, from a clinical standpoint is obviously being really good at um, differential diagnoses and being very careful about um, our background history and how much information um, we're gathering about them uh, before kind of, you know, before kind of jumping to something like conduct disorder mindlessly and not, you know, really thinking about what, um, what other things could be fueling those symptoms. So it's a really good question. 
And I think that's something that, you know, as clinicians, we learn to be, uh, you know, careful, careful about those sort of things. So, um, so I, I would say good differential, good background. Um, yeah, and good, you know, detective work kind of getting into finding out what the, you know, exact symptoms are for the person, their history and the onset and offset of those symptoms so that you have a good se uh, sense of um, what the correct diagnosis is and what sort of, sort of information you should be giving about a youth. So, um, I mean, what I'm talking about here is more of a research frame, and I know this is a bit unusual for this particular series, but, um, but yeah, I think like from a clinical standpoint that, that we would really have to be careful about uh, that and any um, also, if there's dis disproportionate uh, racial ethnic differences, then also we have to be aware of that and then figuring out uh, when that does occur, why is it occurring? And so those factor models um, that I was showing, those are the sort of things where if we start to find like it's differentially represented in a group, then we would have to sort of delve in there and figure out why, why is that occurring? Um, and, and if it is occurring, um, yeah, we need to know why, and if it's art, art, some artificial or other reason, we need to delve into that and solve that problem. Thank you. The next question is, what is the primary purpose of predicting psychopathy in children? And is the labeling process potentially harmful to the labeled child? What are the treatment applications, and how do you consider the possible bias in legal decisions for children who are classified with psychopathy, particularly the callous type? What are the far-reaching implications of a possible classification error on the part of the examiner? Wow, these are so good, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I mean, so what do you guys think? I mean, it's in the DSM now, right? So, um, yeah, so it's in there. I, you know, I don't know, there's, there are a lot of those analog studies, so it's more down the experimental line of research, um, Bocaccini, uh, Kaufman, um, number of other people, some recent uh, 29, at least 2019, I've seen an, another publication on labeling effects. So they're trying to look at like, you know, basically the, the studies are, you have these uh, vignettes and they present them to judges and juries and so forth. And they, the vignette is basically the same information, but the label changes from conduct disorder to psychology. Or maybe, maybe they're even testing uh, limited pro-social emotions and other things now, but um, those labeling studies, initially, I think they did show, show a labeling effect, but after a while, um, the studies have not shown that uh, to be the case um, on, well, you know, on, uh, it, with kind of, kind of considering the, you know, this, the group of studies together. Um, and so the, if you're reading that lurch research, you might think maybe it does not have a, a, such an effect as label. Um, but I, you know, for me, I'm always very careful to update what the term means um, and what, yeah, kind of what it means in terms of stability and treatment. And it, you know, it's not fully stable. Um, it's not a stability of one, it's a stability with some of these longer studies of 0.5, which means a lot of people are coming off of that trajectory. And I think for us as clinical forensic psychologists, it's our job to inform people that even if somebody, you know, does end up at this point in time, having motions that are, um, you know, lacking empathy and lacking remorse, it doesn't mean that that will always be the case for them. And there's a lot of kids that do come off that trajectory and there are, are treatments that work. So it's, it's moderately stable. Uh, there are studies showing it being, you know, stable into adulthood, even after controlling for a lot of variables, but it's not like a one, you know, and so um, I always make that clear to judges and uh, people that I'm talking to about, about that. Um, the construct. So yeah, it's a really good, very good question. I don't know what other people think about, but I, I'm always interested to know, uh, especially now that it is in fact in the DSM uh, where we have those characteristics. The next question is how are girls with conduct disorder different than boys? Presumably, is there more relational aggression? Yeah. Um, our factor models are showing that the items apply uh, similarly to girls as they do to boys. Um, they're, um, yeah, so yeah, it kind of seems to be looking similar. The big difference is in terms of scalar, um, you know, we look at scalar and configural invariance or variance. And on a scalar level, the scores tend to be lower, but the configuration seems to be the same. So. Uh, what that means is the prevalence 
you know, people might think the prevalence is much lower um, in girls and people have different ideas about that. So some people think, well, you know, maybe we should lower the cut score for girls. And I don't think that's a necessarily a good idea. And other thoughts are, well, maybe their behavioral stuff is different. And some of that's like relational aggression and, and other things that they do. Um, and so maybe, I, maybe that is an avenue. I don't think there's enough. I do, I have seen the studies on that, but I don't think there's enough to confirm that their mode of operation is relational aggression. But there's, you know, there's enough there to, you know, I think start thinking about it and trying to uh, develop some more research on that. And some people do, you know, believe things like cyberbullying, other things in adolescence in middle school and high school, uh, those things can be higher in girls, but I think it requires more research to make sure that's actually the case, so. Can you uh, talk about data suggesting that the DI traits are more predictive of recidivism and crime severity, whereas the GM and CD traits are not as much, if at all, after accounting for DI traits? Yeah, that's a good point as well. So we got a very knowledgeable people here on this topic. Um, I, you know, uh, a lot of people think impulsivity counts for a lot of everything that we do in this world in terms of uh, bad decision making and, and antisocial conduct. And it does, it, it does count for a lot of the variants. Um, I, you know, it, it doesn't uh, take away from, you know, like the Fanti study I showed there, there are these other configurations of kids that do still account for antisocial outcomes and antisocial behavior that impulsivity on its own would not necessarily account for. Um, but, but impulsivity and just maybe taking Lee Robbins model of just asking people, you know, about their past behavior, um, that does account for a lot of future offending. But if you look at um, like Asher's meta-analytic study, where she reviewed all the studies on recidivism for kids, and I think that's published in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry as well. Uh, but that, that shows that all four components are predictive of negative outcomes. And um, so they do each have come some, some unique predictive um, value. But yeah, I mean, I think if people were to bet, you know, what's, what's going to account for the most, um, then maybe impulsivity uh, and antisocial personality characteristics do that. But sometimes I think the things that we're measuring and the types of question, questions we're asking in terms of trouble that might come about from a certain personality set of personality traits um, might differ depending on what we ask. And we typically ask like questions about, did you recidivate or are you going back into you know, jail or did you do this? But I think if we start thinking about some of those, char those characteristics, like you know, being maybe feeling like you're superior to other people, I mean, I think that's a pretty damaging uh, trait. And you know, I think we can wreak havoc on the world if people feel like superior and grandiose over other people. And the types of things that they might do um, could be pretty pr pretty problematic, but we might only be picking up like a portion of that because we're I think with the kid literature and the adult we're not we're only asking them certain very kind of straight questions about um, contact with the law, but maybe not how they're messing around with other kids or you know kind of causing other people uh, tr you know difficulties. And and then the Fanti study does pick up on when you combine uh, GM and CU it's a more kind of toxic mix. And he makes the argument, I don't know if this is correct or not, but he makes the argument, if you just have callous emotional traits, it doesn't really matter because if I don't care about people or I don't care about things, I might not do anything wrong, I just don't care. But if you combine that, <laughs> if you combine that with like, hey, I feel better than other people and I, I feel deserved of things and I'm manipulative and deceptive and now you've got those two things going on, then that um, can make things worse. So I don't know if I answered that question well or not, but that's kind of the general general idea there, I think so. Okay. Um, rather than mediation as a pathway, has there been any research on misidentification of uh, as ADHD rather than conduct disorder? So basically diagnosing ADHD when instead the criteria would be met for conduct disorder. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not so sure if I understand the question, but I think there's always the possibility of misdiagnosing somebody. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to, 
we're trying to pull with that PSCD, we're trying to pull this a little bit away from ADHD. And so, and impulsivity, because partly we feel like the items run contrary to one another, just like, you know, kind of we're talking about these different, maybe underlying uh, neuronal things that might be going on for each of the mentions, but partly, you know, sometimes with this construct, they're talking about things that run counter to one another. So saying that you're manipulative and deceptive and planning things out and stuff. Um, and then at the same time on the third thing, saying they're impulsive and uh, <laughs> can't pull things together and inadequate planning and stuff. I mean, it just doesn't harmonize, right? And so, um, yeah, so our daring impulsive trait, that's why it's, we did mention impulsivity just to hook it in with everyone else's research, but it's not, doesn't have any impulsivity items in there. It's just daringness. And so partly what we think there is that these kids are daring, they're sensation seeking, but the, you know, a lot of times the things they're doing is like, it's judicial risk taking versus like um, just kind of, you know, jumping off a cliff without kind of thinking about it sort of thing. And it's that judicial decision-making um, risk taking that fits more with that construct versus maybe just straight up uh, CD or something where um, you can kind of get risk taking going on. And that might, I think that might help us, you know, distinguish things from ADHD a little bit more and not have as many misdiagnoses uh, with that disorder. So it is 10 after, do you want to do one more question or should we, and I know you said you. I'll do one more and then that'll, that, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So final question, um, any recommendations for the use of specifiers in juvenile assessments, particularly transfer from juvenile to adult jurisdictions? Um, well, you know, I think they're using, they are using the construct. I don't know about the specifier. The specifier I'm sure will be used now. Um, this study needs to be done, redone and updated and I, maybe there's work on it. I heard they might be, but Bill Joe and Jody Bill Joe and Emily McDougall and some other people did, um, I think count the number of cases at which uh, psychopathy and the PCLYV and other measures were been used in youth cases. And they showed uh, that basically there was a steady incline across Canada and the United States for the use of this uh, measure and the construct, you know, um, of psychopathy in kids. So that was even before it was placed in the um, DSM. So I think, um, yeah, it probably will be used in transfer questions, you know, um, about, especially when they get to the risk component. And then, uh, yeah, and then I think that's where it gets, you know, those other psycholegal variables that are assessed for that uh, decision making, like the psychosocial maturity and the amenability of treatment will be really important to make sure that if people are doing those evaluations, um, to also highlight the amenability component. I, I do that even with, if I think somebody has like, um, you know, not a lot of emotional uh, resonance to, you know, things that have nice, if, if, if I can, I try to, on the amenability component, try to stress, again, kind of that stability issue and the possibility of um, them uh, making gains in that particular area as a, as a treatment target. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully I answered that. Yeah, I think it will be used. Um, whenever something hits the DSM, it's likely to uh, get used in psycholegal decision-making too. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was thank fantastic. You guys. We really appreciate your time. And everyone that's still on, uh, please go ahead and grab your link. We'll stay on for just another minute. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks thank everyone. you. All right. Yeah. We'll talk Thanks, soon. Thanks, Randy. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. See you next week. All Sounds right. Good. See you guys. Bye-bye. See you next week. All right, Rachel, whenever you're uh, ready when you are. Yeah, I think I'll just shut it down. See you later. See you. Have a good one. You too.